Good to be back here, and we had the privilege of being with you all in November for the uh, couples retreat and thoroughly enjoyed our time, and uh, then to get back here tonight for uh, the tent meeting, and I got to bring my daughter Lydia uh, with me on this trip, and so we've had a good time together, and honestly, for those of us that serve the Lord in the mission field, as we do that pastor in the state of California, it's just kind of good to come back to America every now and then. And, uh, you know, we just we got, got off the plane, we got in a rental car, and people smile, and, and uh, they're kind, and, and uh, we just had a good time being back in the good old USA, and uh, we, I told Lydia, I said, we don't have a lot of time on this trip, but there's a couple of things you got to do when you're in Tennessee, and one of those is you got to get some Tennessee barbecue, so we got that in, uh, kind of a late lunch, we enjoyed that together, and uh, we, we love uh, this church, we love your pastor, and so thankful for what God is doing here, and grateful uh, to be here tonight and get to be a part of this meeting. Clark family, thank you for the music. And uh, they told me as, as uh, they mentioned the meeting that you would be here. And uh, I love the Clark family and I love their music. And anybody who knows me knows that because I'm, I'm cheap when it comes to subscriptions and things like that. I don't believe in paying for any of that kind of stuff. Uh, but the only music I do pay for is the Clark family. <laughs> and everything they've ever uh, produced, I own it. And, uh, and I was candidating last year, and they said, Now, Brother Rule, what is your music philosophy? Uh, what's the music going to be like? And I said, well, when it comes to music ability, what I have, what the Bible says is a joyful noise. That's about it. That's what I have. It's what I know. Uh, but I know what I like. And I said, you know, the Clark family, that's the kind of music I like. And, and so I, uh, I appreciate the music. You know what I like about the Clark family? A couple of things I was thinking as they were singing tonight was I remember purchasing the first uh, album or CD or whatever it was back in the day and now digital sh for sure. But as I encourage people, and I often buy lots of their uh, music and encourage that as far as gifts and so on. But, you know, the music as far as the, uh, the doctrine, uh, glorifying the Lord, honoring Christ, being Christ-centered, it's the same as it was when it started as it is today. And you can't say that about many people in that area, and I'm just so thankful for that. And then uh, to the families, Brother Mike, I was thinking as I was watching up here singing with your kids, and, and we're a little behind. Uh, I have children that are 13, 15, 17, 19 uh, right now. So pray for my wife, Susanna, and I. If you want to put us on the list, uh, we're parenting four teenagers and having a ball. Uh, but I was looking at your family, and I was thinking, thank you for just staying faithful and staying with them. Um, we sat our kids down recently, and we said, we want you to serve the Lord because you love him. But if you choose to serve him, it will expand our ministry significantly. Because if the people you're influencing the closest don't really believe what you say you believe and don't practice what you practice, it says a lot. And I really appreciate a family who serves the Lord together and understands the importance of honoring the Lord generationally, and it's a blessing, and thank you for that, and Joan Lauren, so good to see you, and appreciate your spirit, uh, always so kind, and Pastor and Mrs. Norris, we sure just love you. When we were here for the couples retreat in November, I had taken the pastorate in August, and while we were here in Tennessee, we had some things back home not going all that well, and we finished that couples retreat, and I don't even remember where we went. We went to a restaurant, we went to a booth, and then Susanna and I just sat there across the booth from your pastor and his wife and tears just coming down our eyes. We were like, we're doing this wrong, we're doing this wrong, we're doing this wrong. Tell us what to do. And your pastor and his wife so graciously just poured their life into us for a couple of hours before we jumped on a plane and went back to California. And I don't know that they'll ever know the encouragement that that was to us and the privilege that we have in serving the Lord. So I want to thank you for the privilege of being here tonight, and I'm looking forward to it. Take your Bibles, 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings in chapter number 7. And uh, what a great crowd tonight. And uh, enjoyed all of the music. Thank you for it. 
uh, enjoyed the choir tonight, and I enjoyed the little guys right on the front. Man, that was my favorite part of the choir tonight right there. I feel a little better about our choir when I know. And, uh, but I enjoyed the choir tonight, and I enjoyed the music. I enjoyed all of it, and great crowd, and thank you for a wonderful spirit that you brought <clears throat> and praying tonight to be a blessing. There was an elderly gentleman and his wife, and they were traveling from Memphis to Nashville. And they were enjoying the trip, and things were going along nicely. And then they had some unexpected car trouble, and he had to pull off at the nearest gas station. He got out and started talking with the mechanic, telling him what was happening, and maybe he could help him with the car. His wife was really hard of hearing, and so the gentleman knew that and, and helped her as he could. The mechanic asked the gentleman, he said, well, where are you headed? And the husband said, well, we're going to Nashville. He was telling the mechanic that. And his wife, who was nearby and kind of listening, she said, what did he say? And uh, he said, he asked where we're from, and I told him we're from Nashville. She said, oh, okay. And then they were talking a little longer, and the mechanic said, well, where are you going? He said, well, we're going to Memphis. And his wife right on cue, what did he say? And uh, he said, well, he asked where we're going, and I told him we're going to Memphis. The man looked back at the mechanic, and he said, Memphis. And I lived in Memphis once. And in Memphis, there was a lady. She was the meanest, rudest, ugliest, honoriest old woman I ever met. In fact, it was really because of her I moved and came here. The mechanic was telling the husband that. And the wife said, what did he say? And the husband said, he knows your sister. And uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we haven't met anybody like that on this trip so far. So uh, it's all been good. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to our time together tonight. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse number 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore... And let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And I want to preach a message tonight entitled, We Have to Do Something. We have to do something. I love the great Old Testament stories that we find in God's Word. And this is one of my favorites. You may not be all that familiar with it. Here are these four leprous men, and we enter into a conversation that they're having, and the conversation they're having is about their death. Uh, if we go here, we're going to die. If we go here, we're going to die. If we go here, we might die. And, and they're discussing what their next move is going to be. These are men who are outcasts. They, they are in a terrible predicament, but God uses them in a special way, and there's some lessons in this that I think will be an encouragement, encouragement to us tonight. I want you to see, first of all, in this story, the plight of the land. This was a very difficult time for the nation of Israel. This was a dark hour in their history, and there's a few reasons uh, for that as we come into this a portion of Scripture. We see, first of all, this was because Samaria was besieged. Go back to chapter 6 and verse number 24. The Bible says, and it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, at this time in history, Israel's divided. You have the northern kingdom. You have the southern kingdom. Jerusalem is the capital of the southern kingdom. And then Samaria here is the capital of the northern kingdom. And King Jehoram here and the people of this city, they are besieged. We read about Benadad. He's the king of Syria. He's a cruel king. He was ruthless. And this uh, uh, army with under the leadership of this king has come, and they have besieged Samaria. The siege warfare, the word siege, a Latin word, it means to set. This was a common practice of warfare in this day. An army, an opposing army, would gather the resources and the materials they might need to last for a couple of months, sometimes a couple of years. And then they would go, and they would encompass the city. They would let no one in and no one out, and they would just wait until they could take the city and conquer it, or the city would surrender. And that's where we find God's people in his kingdom in the capital city of Samaria. They're besieged by 
the Syrians. They're under attack. They can't leave the city. They can't get anything, and nobody can bring them any help. The result of that is the land is barren. Notice this in verse number 25. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So it's bad in Samaria. I mean, they, we think we have inflation problems today in America. I'm telling you, we have nothing compared to what they had going in Samaria. They're paying a king's ransom for the meat that they could scrape off the head of a donkey. They're paying money for what nutrition they could get from part of the dung of a dove. I mean, this is rough times. This is the inflation of famine. This is the result of being besieged. This city is under it. There's no food. There's great sorrow. There's great persecution. Everybody is starving, and they're doing whatever they can to survive. It gets worse. Verse number 26, and as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? And the king said to her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And then I said unto her, The next day give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. The king cannot believe what he's hearing. He knows that the people are suffering. He knows that the people are starving. He knows that people are dying. He knows that a small fortune is being spent for any nutrition they can get to survive. But this story just sets him back. These two moms entering into this agreement that it's us or nothing else. So let's eat your son today. We'll eat my son tomorrow. And it's terrible, but this is what it's going to take to survive. And the second mom reneges on the commitment and hides her son. And now she, with sorrow in her heart, is telling the king about it. And he can't believe that now literally God's children have come to cannibalizing themselves in order to survive. This was a dark hour amongst God's children in their history. It's amazing where we are in America today. Oftentimes we see things come across the news that I don't know about you, I read and I think, I never thought I would see that in my lifetime. I'm thankful for the recent decision last summer of our Supreme Court to overturn the decision Roe versus Wade. I'm thankful for that. I believe life begins at conception. I believe abortion is murder. I believe if somebody in here has had an abortion, that God is merciful and gracious, and the, the ground is level to cross. We've heard all of that sung about tonight, but that doesn't change the fact that it's murder. And we're thankful for that decision. The state in which I pastor is a sanctuary state. When that decision was made, our governor came out and said, we will uh, rectify abortion into our constitution as a state. For everyone in our state and everyone seeking safe harbor from other states who are beginning to restrict or outlaw abortion. In fact, one out of every eight abortions in the United States of America occurs in the state of California. Just this past fall, Prop 1 was passed in our state. And Prop 1 relifted the limits on abortion. Prop 1, which passed in November, went into law in January in the state in which I pastor allows taxpayer-funded late-term abortions at any time, for any reason, up till birth. There needs to be no health concern for the child or the mother. It simply is choice. In the state of California, as I pastor here, you can abort up through birth with no penalty. Now, how do we get there? We see the agenda of the LGBTQ plus crowd. We, we see a sight set on the next generation. In our state, just last week, 
a judge stepped in and blocked a school district's policy down in Southern California because this school had the audacity to require that parents would be notified if their child wanted to change their gender. And because the school came out and said, a Chino Unified in Southern California, because they came out and they said, if students want to change their gender, we are going to tell their parents. Our state sued the school, blocked the school's policy, put a restraining order on them. In fact, our California Attorney General Rob Bonta said, San Bernardino Superior Court's decision to issue a temporary restraining order rightfully upholds the state rights of our LGBTQ plus student community and protects kids from harm by immediately halting the board's forced outing policy. He went on to say, while this fight is far from over, today's ruling takes a significant step toward ensuring the physical, mental, and emotional well-being of transgender and gender non-conforming students. The state in which I pastor has said, we have to protect the students from their parents. We know better, so we are going to provide a sanctuary at school where they can choose their gender. By the way, that law is effective down to five years old. And we're not telling the parents. In fact, if that child wants to be a different gender and they tell a teacher about it, but they tell the teacher they can't do that because their parents don't want them to do it, now in the state of California, you can call CPS on those parents and they can be treated for abuse just as they would be if they were physically harming or preventing nutrition for a child. Now, if they are not affirming the gender of their choice beginning at five years old, they can be found in contempt because they are harming that child. Now, I got to tell you, we live in a wicked day. We live in a very wicked time. I, I was told my whole life growing up that the closer we get to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will watch Satan unload and unleash. And he will be working overtime all the time. And I'm here to tell you tonight, church, that's exactly what's happening. That's exactly what's happening. Satan is having his way. Satan is doing all that he can to destroy lives. Our country is full of violence and bitterness and hatred and anger and division and perversion and wickedness and all of the things that we see today and we know what the bible says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived we know the bible warns you and i warn them that call good evil and good and evil good god tells us hey be careful those that are putting darkness for light and light for darkness we know all of that but how did we get here we got here because we got away from the Word of God. We have chased God out of culture. We have thrown God out of society. We don't want God. We don't want His Word. We don't want prayer. We don't want anything that has anything to do with God, by and large, in our country today. It's a sad time. It was a sad time in the history of God's children that we read about tonight. But I want to point this out before we move on. The lady went to the king. Church, can I encourage you tonight? Our king is still on the throne. He is still a life-changing God. He is our present help in trouble. He still has all power. I so appreciated the song about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ tonight because indeed it is ready to save. And all that we've just described and as heavy and as powerful as it is, Jesus is the answer to all of that and more. We have a king we can go to. We see what these people are going through. But notice with me in this story how the preacher is blamed. Look at verse number 31. Then he, the king, said, God do so more and also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Here's the king in sackcloth. He's heard this story of these moms boiling this boy and eating him. He can't believe what's happening in the city. He can't believe the perversion and the wickedness and the desperation. And he looks at the people that are looking at him and he says, hey, I'm going to tell you whose fault this is. It's the preachers. It's Elisha's. 
It's because of him that we are in this situation. It's his fault. In fact, I think we should take his life. That would resolve what we're facing. Now, the nation of Israel is lucky they had a prophet. They should be thankful they had one. And they had a good one. And they had one that was faithfully preaching and teaching the word of God. And we know that God spake by his prophets in this day. And I want to encourage you here at Franklin Road Baptist Church to be thankful for a pastor who faithfully stands and preaches the word of God. Faithfully stands and preaches, thus saith the Lord. He isn't looking for what is culturally accepted. He isn't looking for, well, what do people want to hear? He's just asking the Lord, what do you want me to say? And being faithful to the preaching and teaching of God's word. But we see the people in this story blaming the preacher. It sounds familiar today, does it not? You see the situation that we are in in America, the problems that abound, and we are told we're the problem. We are told it is because we are not tolerant that if we would just learn to be more tolerant, all of the hatred, all of the divisiveness, all of the violence, all of it would go away if we would just be tolerant. Which, of course, we were told that's all they wanted was tolerance. Then we were told they wanted acceptance, equality. Now we see unfolding in our country. They don't want that. They want you and I selling it. And if you and I are not willing to bow down and to sell this message that is anti-Christ, then we are the ones that are not tolerant. Coming from the crowd that is tolerant of anything except anything that has to do with Jesus Christ. And there must be an understanding tonight of where we are. There must be an understanding tonight of what's happening. There must be some discernment amongst God's people to understand that we have lost this. We need revival in our land tonight. And that begins with you. And that begins with me. And we've got to understand tonight, hey, this is a time of urgency. This is a time of seriousness. There's a battle going on. This is, this is happening right now in our lifetime and people are in the balance of it all between heaven and hell and we must be cognizant of this and recognize the moment in which we are in. We need the Lord and we need revival in our country. Now, we're not going to stop the siege. It's on and it's going to be on till the trumpet sounds. We are in a fight. That's what it is. We either are going to get in or we're going to get out. We either are going to be a part and participate or we're going to spectate. But it's on. The fight's on. It's not going anywhere. Satan knows he has but a time. And he's going to unleash all that he can. But I am thankful tonight that I can come from California and remind you tonight that he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And he is capable of doing abundantly above all that we ask or think. We've got all that we need. We have God. We have his word. But we need a recognition. Hey, there's a tough time going on. So the notes with you tonight, the persistence of these lepers. One commentator said, God often chooses what to us would seem the most unlikely instruments so that the work may be seen to be of him and the glory all of his. And there would be no more unlikely instruments to bring reconciliation to this mess than these four leprous men. Notice the resume in verse number three of chapter seven. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. Now, now what did these men have? Uh, to bring to the table to solve the problem we have just described. The, the city of Samaria is besieged. The Syrian army is all the way around them. Nobody's going in and nobody's going out and they're starving to death. They're paying a fortune for the meat on the head of a donkey. They're following around birds trying to find dung to get nutrition. They're boiling boys and they're eating him. The king is blaming the preacher. It's an entire dysfunctional mess that's happening. Who's going to bring resolution to this? These four lepers? The Bible says in verse 3 that they were at the entering of the gate. Why is that? They're not even in the city. They're excluded from society. They're living in a leprous colony. 
They're dependent upon friends and family to bring food if they're even going to survive. How could these men do anything? Now, why were they out there? Well, because when you had leprosy, you were unclean. We learn this in Leviticus, and the priest shall look on the plague and the skin of the flesh, and when the hair and the plague has turned white, and the plague in sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, it is a plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. When you had leprosy and you were pronounced unclean, it was said of you that all the days in wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled, he is unclean, he shall dwell alone, without the camp shall his habitation be. These four men had one thing in common, and that is they had leprosy. They had been determined you're unclean. You gotta leave the city. You gotta live outside the city. That's where your habitation's gonna be. You gotta be away from everybody else. In fact, they were so scared of leprosy that the lepers were told, if you walk and you see other people near you, you need to warn them, unclean, unclean. And as they walk by you and they hear that, they're gonna know you have leprosy and they're to stay as far away from you as they possibly can because they don't wanna catch that dreaded disease that you have of leprosy. That's these four men. They have leprosy. They're outside the city. They're outcast. They're unclean. They're, they're, they're separated from anyone that they know and love. By the way, leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible. When we think about your life and my life, before we came to Christ, we were in a predicament as equally terrible, and we were in a predicament of sin that was unclean. We were in a predicament of sin that, where we were separated away from God. But I encourage you tonight that then... Jesus came. The Bible says in Psalms, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me. He heard my cry. He brought me off out of a horrible pit, out of a miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and shall trust in the Lord. You and I had the same problem that these men had, and that is sin. But God has been so very good to us. We see this leprous problem. These men in the most difficult situation in which they could provide any help. You know, sometimes we hear about the state of our land, and I'm not, I'm not telling you anything tonight you don't already know, but sometimes we hear that or we see it or we read it and we think to ourselves, I know it's true, but what can I do? I'm me. I know there's problems. I know there's wickedness. I know there's perversion. I, I know Satan's working overtime. I know people are hurting. I know lives are being destroyed and families are being wrecked. I know all those things to be true, but what can I do? And I believe tonight as we watch God use four leprous men who weren't even allowed to be inside the city, it's gonna encourage you and I and it's gonna challenge you and I. God can use us. I was preaching in Wisconsin about a month ago and I was doing some training for a friend and about 125 leaders in their church. And we finished a session, Brother Mike, and a man came up to him by the name of Jim Smith. Jim Smith is 70 years old. He said, Pastor Gabe, I want you to know something. My name is Jim. My wife and I, we teach the kindergarten class every Sunday morning at, at, during church, and we love it. And my prayer is that God is gonna let me do that 10 more years till I'm 80. That's my goal. That's what I'm praying for. I want 10 more years teaching the kindergarten kids every Sunday morning in Wisconsin until I'm 80 years old. That's what I want to do. I mean, this guy was so into teaching the kindergarten kids. I'm on the flight home Saturday afternoon getting home to preach Sunday. He's emailing me video clips of him teaching the kindergarten class about David and Goliath or Daniel and Lions in or whatever. He wanted me to have it for ideas or whatever. I don't know. It was great. And he's sending me video clips of him teaching. You know, here he is, 70 years old, and he's in there teaching those kids. And I was on that plane, and I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about the mic, Lord, at Pleasant Valley Baptist Church in Chico, California, give me an army of Jim Smiths. Give me an army of people that say, hey, I want 10 more years till I'm 80 to serve God. Let me go teach the kindergarten kids. Let me teach them God's word. Let me tell them that God loves them. Let me make a difference in the next generation that follows thereafter. Man, there is something all of us can do, and we see that in these men. Now, notice this conversation that they're having 
and they were four leprous men, verse 3, entering at the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say that we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we stay, sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall into the hosts of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. I love the attitude of these leprous men. They're sitting outside the gate. They're starving like everybody else. Nobody's giving them the meat from the head of a donkey. Nobody's sharing their dung from a dove with these guys. These are leprous men, and they're dying, and nobody cares. And they're sitting there talking amongst themselves like, guys, we got to do something. We're dying. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go in the city of Samaria where they don't want us because we have leprosy, that's not going to do us any good because they're all dying. We've heard what they're paying just for the meat from the head of a donkey. Now, if we go to the enemy camp of Syria, they have food. Now, they might kill us. They might see us walking up and we're the enemy, or they might see us walking up and we have leprosy, and it might be over like that, but maybe not. Maybe they would have mercy. Maybe they would give us some food. That was the only option that had the prospect of some food, and they said, that's where we're going prospect of death on every side but maybe food at the enemy camp and so that's where they go you know what i love about that it's an attitude of we have to do something franklin road if god would allow me tonight to come in here from california and tell you i love you and encourage you tonight we have to do something it cannot just be pastor has got to do something The staff, boy, they have got to do something. Yes, I agree, Pastor Gabe, the Clark family, they got to keep doing something. No, 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 no. I'm saying all of us have got to do something. Every one of us have got to put our hand to the plow and say, hey, there's something that I can do. There's something I can do for the kingdom's sake. There's something I can do for the Lord. There's something I can do here at Franklin Road. All of us have to have this attitude and this spirit. Hey, there's something we can do. Do. This is the attitude that we must have. We cannot be pessimistic. We cannot be a quitter. We cannot throw in the towel. The Bible says a just man falls seven times yet riseth up again. All of us must be doing something for the Lord. We know that our attitude determines our altitude. By the way, we all determine our own attitude. And we want to have an attitude of doing something for him. Now why is it in some churches that people don't do something for the Lord? Well, sometimes it's inability. They believe that there's not really anything they can do. They look at the Syrian army. (laughs) They look at scraping meat from the head of a donkey. They look at the odds. They look at the resources. They're tired. They're discouraged. And they're thinking, what can I do? If I decided tonight I'm going to do something, what would that even matter? How would that even make a difference? Could God use me? Joshua Chamberlain was an English professor in the state of Maine. Civil war broke out, and he enlisted in the Union Army. He was given leadership of the 20th Maine Regiment of the Union Army. This regiment was a 1,000 men under Colonel Joshua Chamberlain's leadership. They fought valiantly in different battles and skirmishes of the Civil War. And finally, it came time to receive a pinnacle assignment. That assignment was to defend the southern slope of the Little Round Top. Now, this was very important because Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and these men from the Union Army during the Civil War, he had 1,000 to begin with. Now he's down to just 300, and they were told, you need to hold the southern slope of the little round top. This is the extreme left of the Union line. At all costs, you've got to hold it because this is our extreme left, and this line goes all the way down to a little town you may have heard of, Gettysburg. Whatever you do, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain, hold the line. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain got his men together, two of his own brothers in the regiment. He gave them their orders. He said, we're going to 
build a stone wall and they went and they picked up rocks in the field and they began to build a stone wall. It was about waist high and about a football field in length and Colonel Joshua Chamberlain looked at those 300 men and he said, men, no matter what, we are gonna hold the line and sure enough, that battle at Gettysburg went in array and these men defending the southern slope with a little round top, the extreme left of the Union Army line and advancement from the Confederate troop after advancement after advancement they held the line after one such skirmish late in the day the confederate troops retreated and they were getting reinforcements and colonel joshua chamberlain gathered his men he started the day with 300 at this time of the day he has just a little over 100 and the men are looking and they're saying colonel what do you want us to do we're out of ammunition what are your orders sir he said get the ammunition from the dead and the wounded and use that they said sir that's what you said last time we've done all of that we have no ammunition and while they're having this conversation there's a boy up in the tree he's 15 years old and he's the scout and he's looking out over where the confederate troops are and they're getting reinforcements and they're getting more artillery and he says colonel they're coming colonel they're coming and here they began to make that advancement and those men are looking at colonel joshua chamberlain sir what are your orders and he looked at those hundred men that day and he said fix bayonets fix bayonets I don't know what those guys were thinking. If I were standing there, I'd be like, what do you mean, fix bayonet? I'm going to put a little knife in the end of my gun, and they've got real bullets. What are we going to do with our bayonets? But sure enough, those men followed his leadership, and you could hear all down that stone wall, that sound of metal on metal, and those men fixed bayonets. And Colonel Joshua Chamberlain said, men, you watch me, and when I say charge, you follow me, and we're going to defend the southern slope with a little round top. And sure enough, they crouched down behind that stone wall, that boy up in that tree scouting and giving Colonel Joshua Chamberlain the Confederate Army position. And at just the right time, Colonel Joshua Chamberlain jumped over that wall and he yelled, charge! And those 100 men did with him. And that day, a few Union soldiers held the southern slope of the little round top. They captured hundreds of, of Confederate soldiers. Historians tell you and I that if the Union Army would not have held the line at Gettysburg, if they would have lost the battle at Gettysburg, many historians believe that would have been the turning of the tide and that the Confederate Army would have won the Civil War. Some historians believe that had the Confederate Army won the Civil War, that America today would be more like Europe comprised of 9 to 13 individual countries and not the one United States of America who when the wicked rulers of World War I and World War II came on the scene there was the United States of America to step in you say Pastor Gabe where are you going with all that here's where I'm going there was an English professor in the state of Maine who made a decision to fix bayonets and it affects my life today. I live in a free country. I, I came here of my own free will. I have my Bible tonight. I'm preaching tonight. I will fly home tomorrow. I will stand in the pulpit in the state of California as much as uh, what's happening there. I would rather serve the Lord in no other place than right where I am. I love it right on the front line and I will stand tomorrow night and I will preach God's word behind that pulpit and I have the freedom and the liberty to do that and I love the good old USA and I'm telling you I have that because an English teacher in the state of Maine did something. And I just want to encourage you tonight that if you will do something, it will make a difference. Do not let Satan tell you, well, you could not make a difference. Yes, you can. Everyone in this tent, everyone in the sound of my voice tonight can make a difference. How? By doing something. Moses just had a rod. The lad just had two loaves and two fishes and five loaves. David just had a sling and a stone. Gideon just had three men. It doesn't matter what we have. If we will give it to the king of kings, that's all we need, and God can use it to do a great thing. For some, it's the inability. They don't think they can, but some, they've slipped into indifference. They've gotten to a place where they don't care. I 
I'm not here tonight to be mean. But there are people in Murfreesboro, Tennessee tonight going to hell. We, we, we rag on California and we're okay with that. But it wasn't all good, everything I saw today. There's a need right here. There's people right here in this community that need to know about Jesus. There's people you work with. There's neighbors you have that if the trumpet were to sound tonight, while we would be rejoicing in the eternal skies, and we should, they would be in a Christless hell. Does that bother you? Does it bother you knowing that coworker does not know the Lord? Does it keep you up at night when you think about that neighbor and where they're going to spend in eternity? Do you have that list of people that God has brought into your life and you've not yet been able to share the gospel with him? Is there a concern in our heart? We know our football team. We know our hobbies. We know the things we care about. But friend, if we are not careful, we can be a part of a great church and we can loathe into indifference and we cannot even care about eternity. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to minister, not be ministered to. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. It wasn't about him. It was all about people knowing Jesus. Our life must be spent pointing people to Jesus Christ. But that is not going to happen if we do not have a heart of love and care and concern for others. We see the difficulty these people were in. We see these four leprous men. What can they do? Well, they said, we'll do something. Now let's watch as the Lord shows up. By the way, whenever you and I step out in faith, God loves showing up. God often in heaven is up there just like, please let me get involved here. Man, I could do so much. Somebody exercise some faith and let me work and then watch what I can do. Man, God was ready here these men gave him a shot. Look, notice this in verse number five. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were there, come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the hosts of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel, Jehoram, who we read about earlier, hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was and fled for their life so here are these four leprous men they're outside the city of Samaria if we stay here we're going to die if we go in the city we're going to die if we go to the Syrians we're probably going to die but they have food it is amazing what you can get people to do when you offer food that's just a Baptist church deal but anyway there could be food there and so they go. And to their amazement, as they begin to creep up on that uh, army, the tents, the encampment that was around that city of Samaria, as they begin to creep up to those enemy tents, to their amazement, there's, there's nobody watching. There's nobody watching. There, there's, there's no activity. There's, there's no noise. They get all the way into that camp, and there's, there's nobody. The tents are vacant. Everything is as it was, but nobody is there. They don't find one enemy soldier. And you and I read why. Because that enemy, a group, heard a noise, a noise, a noise. And they said, well, we know what happened. King Jehoram got some money somehow. He hired these other armies. They're coming after us. We got to go. They hightailed it 25 miles to the Jordan River because they heard a noise. Friend, we still serve a God who's making a noise. We still serve a God who can make a difference. It doesn't matter how dark the hour. It doesn't matter how severe the odds. It doesn't matter how much it may look like nothing can happen. God can work in the impossible situation. And indeed, he did. And they find nobody, and they're shocked by it. And notice in verse number 8, And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent 
and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Not only were these uh, soldiers surprised, they were savoring what God did. Man, they go into the camp, they're shocked. There's nobody around. Then they go into that first tent and oh, they could smell it. I mean, they haven't eaten anything in so long. And what they had before was just what people would throw. The scraps, it was either to the pigs or to the lepers. That's what their diet was. But man, they could smell it. They went into that tent, and I don't know what that tent was having that night. Maybe Italian. Maybe lasagna. Maybe, you know, the bread, the Caesar salad. I don't know. They, maybe another tent. They had Mexican. I don't know. But the Bible says they went tent to tent, and man, there was food there, and they were eating that food. Then they saw gold and silver. They saw raiment, extra clothes. They were gathering what they could. They were hiding the goodness of the Lord. They were eating. I mean, they were feeling full for the first time in a long time. God provided for them I appreciate the song tonight God indeed is good tonight friend we are full you say Pastor Gabe you don't know my situation I would not describe myself as full friend if I got what I deserved I would spend an eternity in hell but God in his love gave. And Jesus Christ in his love said, Father, I'll go. And he came to this earth and he was born of a virgin in a manger and he lived a perfect life. And at the end of his life, he died on the cross and he shed his blood on Mount Calvary and he was buried. And three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead and through his victory over death and sin, he paid my sin debt and he paid your sin debt. And if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your savior, if he is your companion, if heaven is your home, I wanna remind you tonight, you're full. You're full. We are blessed. God is so good. These men were willing to do something. and God blessed them for it. But I want you to see something as we close. In verse number nine. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace if we tarry till the morning light. Some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and they called the porter of the city and they told them saying, we came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters and they told it to the king's house within. This is remarkable. These four leprous men, why sit we here until we die? What a question. We got to go do something. Let's take a chance. Let's go to enemy camp. Maybe we get food. And they watch God do a miracle. And there is no enemy. And there's plenty of food. And they are enjoying the goodness of God and the food and the raiment and the gold and the silver. And then they remembered. Hey, guys. Remember what we heard? was going on in Samaria remember what we heard about how much they were paying for the meat they could carve off the head of a donkey remember what we heard that they were taking the dung of a dove and dividing it and paying for it to get some nutrition remember that crazy story we heard about those two moms and taking a boy and boiling him and eating him you remember what we heard that was going on hey guys we can't wait. I know it's the middle of the night, but I'm telling you, if we wait till tomorrow morning and then we go and we knock on the city gates and we tell them there's food and there's raiment and there's gold and there's silver and God has provided, if we wait till tomorrow morning, we're gonna get in trouble because somebody's gonna say, hang on, you knew about this last night and you didn't tell us? Somebody could die tonight. Something could happen in that city. We have to go right now. And that's exactly what they did. And they went to that gate in the middle of the night and they told them, 
the goodness of their God. Franklin Road, can I challenge you tonight? If we're not telling, we do not well. We do not well. We do not well. Friend, there's nothing more simple than this. We are to preach the gospel to every creature. And God's going to put someone in your life tomorrow. And it's a divine appointment. And God wants you to tell them. God wants you to say, hey, we're having a tent revival. You want to come with me tonight? Hey, you got a minute? I want to tell you about my best friend. His name is Jesus. Hey, I've noticed you've been dealing with some burdens. I want to tell you about somebody who can make all the difference in your life. Friend, we do not well if we are enjoying the goodness of God but not telling others about him. These men could not wait. They had to go in that moment to tell. Well, Pastor Gabe, we live in a difficult area. Yeah, so did they. Mothers were eating their kids. Yeah, but Pastor Gabe, I don't have a lot to offer. Neither did they. They were lepers. How would you like to be a witness for Franklin Road and wherever you went, whenever you saw people, you had to say, unclean, unclean. Hey, can I invite you to church? That would be a difficult witnessing situation. <laughs> These are four leprous men. But God used them in a special way. People were hurting. The lepers did something. And God wrought a miracle. I know that Franklin Road is a miracle work. I understand that. I know what a miracle is. Something only God can do. And I know tonight I'm looking at one. And I praise God for it. But I'm telling you tonight, we can be in the middle of one and we can miss it. We can be in the middle of it and miss it. And we need to be reminded, God is good. People are hurting. And I need to go and tell them about Jesus. We have to do something.